The views shared on this podcast are those of Mike Sowers and do not represent those of Commercial Investors Group. The information shared is not investment advice. Please consult your financial, legal, and tax advisors before making an investment decision. We are going to talk about joint venture jargon with Brad Heitzinger today. He's an investor and an attorney who specializes in putting together joint venture structure, funds, and is going to talk a little bit about opportunity zones and other funding best practices. You're going to learn how to think through a partnership in structuring that organizational operational agreement. And you're also going to get some information on, you know, how to structure the financial economics of your partnership to incentivize people to partner with you. What are some tips and tricks, do's and don't do's when it comes to raising money from people, especially if you don't have an existing relationship. Grab your notepad and get excited for today's show. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those that worry sharing their ideas will hinder their success and those who are driven by the success of others. The first kind view everyone as a competitor. They guard their playbook tight to their chest, rarely collaborate outside their inner circle and are reluctant to show their cards. Then there are the second kind, the kind who have graduated from the first category. They don't count the number of deals they've done. What counts to them is the number of people they impact and the depth to which they impact them. Achievement is still important to them, but it's subordinated to the depth of their purpose. So they give freely of their time, knowledge, and expertise to build a bridge for those who follow in their footsteps. These are the people who were called to change the world. These are the people who develop people, places, and ideas. And this is the show where they do it on the Creative Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Today, I have my radio voice to present Mr. Brad Heitzinger, who's joining us and is an attorney who's going to talk about a lot of cool different joint venture structures. We might get into some opportunity funds. Thanks for joining us today, Brad. Yeah, thanks. I also have my associate, Mr. James Smith. Thanks for coming in. You bet. And so, Brad, uh, tell me about uh, yourself, your experience in the real estate industry, and what kinds of things you got going on. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me. I'm an attorney by day uh, with Gray Plant Moody in the real estate industry. I also have a master's in tax law, so I do a lot of structuring deals uh, for developers locally and nationally. I also do real estate investing on the side. I uh, started out mostly doing residential rehab flips with duplexes, and I've done some uh, with other partners, some some new development townhomes and, and smaller developments like that. And then uh, recently um, have joined a couple other guys to do some commercial uh, investment through either, you know, potentially fund structures or just ourselves. So um, sort of all-encompassing real estate, but uh, day job is, uh, is an attorney. Mm. Well, this is a unique opportunity for me to flush out some of the nuances of joint ventures. So you had mentioned the term kind of waterfall. Uh, can you explain what that is to our listeners? Yeah, sure. So a waterfall structure is basically a structure that's used when you have a fund. And let, maybe I'll just take a step back. So sure. a fund is a real estate structure in which you typically have a sponsor. Uh, that person finds the deals, runs the deals, you know, gets them under contract typically. And then once they have that done, oftentimes that sponsor does not have enough capital to do the deal on their, their own. So they go out and get other investors. Um, and there's some securities issues with that um, that I can dive into, but won't do just for this discussion. Those investors then come into the deal and there'll be you know limited investors in the deal. And then that sponsor uh, gets a percentage of sort of the distribution profits um, as the deal goes on. And how the waterfall structure works is that sponsor comes in typically in a separate entity and they'll get a split of the deal based on... Um, a percentage of return um, that the deal hits. So for example, if I set up a fund, um, you'd have a preferred return typically. So that return goes back to the investors that came with capital, not the sponsor. Um, typically it's 8%, somewhere between 6 and 8%. Currently you're looking at about an 8% preferred return. And then thereafter, um, once that preferred return, 8%, we'll say for purposes of this discussion is hit, then it goes to usually with a 70, 30 or an 80, 20 split. And that's the waterfall. So after the investors reach that 8% preferred return, then it is split, all the profits uh, or distributions thereafter are split 80, 20, and 80 typically going to the investors and 20% going to that sponsor. So the waterfall itself, that 20% is how the sponsor gets paid, even though they didn't bring capital to the deal. Yep. And that can be uh, referred to as their promote 
Yep, exactly right. And, you know, oftentimes there's even two to three tier structures. So, you know, it might be, all right, preferred return of 8% thereafter until uh, what's called an internal rate of return is hit to 10%, then it might go to uh, 70, 30. And then once a 15% internal rate of return is received, then you might hit, a, you know, like a 90, 10. So there can be multiple tiers of it. And it just is really based on you know, what numbers the, the sponsor's hitting, what the deal is hitting. Sure. What kinds of other collateral fees are you seeing? Uh, are most of the sponsors that deals that you're working on, are they also managing, leasing? Are they taking acquisition or uh, asset management fees? Yeah, oftentimes uh, they'll for sure be an asset management fee. Again, this is a lot to do based on, you know, size of the deal. Is it multiple asset deal? How many assets are part of the, the fund? Uh, but usually it's around 1% to 2% asset management fee per year okay. um, and then in terms of leasing oftentimes it's you know outsourced to a third party oftentimes though the deals that i do are to affiliates which it has to be disclosed um, so not a lot of fees with regard to that i mean oftentimes it's the asset management fee if you're talking about you know a you know 100 to 500 million dollar fund then there's there's other fees they'll take a leasing fee to find the other you know third parties um, i'd say Anywhere from 1% to 4% aggregate of all fees in terms of the, the sponsor fees. Sure. What are you seeing for kind of property management fees on the kind of 1% to $10 million asset uh, value properties? 5 to 6%. 5 to 6%. Yep. And so your role, you're, are, you're actually doing the, the contract writing in your day job for these? Yeah, yep. So set up, well, first, you know, initial meeting, what are you looking to do? come up with the most advantageous tax-wise structure. And then, you know, the big part about a fund is really just setting up, um, the, the, you know, the operating agreements or partnership agreements, which lays out all the details of, again, that waterfall structure, management rights, um, you know, sort of the whole deal in one package. So you call it a fund. If I do a joint venture with three other, you know, partners, let's say I'm the general partner and they're limited partners, does it necessarily have to be a fund? Nope, nope. Doesn't have to be a fund. Uh, you see a lot of uh, joint JVs, joint ventures uh, as well, um, and that is done through a joint venture agreement, which is, uh, I'd say, a little bit less robust. Um, that's more just a divide and conquer as opposed to people coming into a deal together. So when, so what's the difference between a fund and a JV? So a JV, um, at least the ones I've set up, is all parties are are pretty involved in the agreement, you know, in the deal. So, you know, if you and I have a have a deal we're working on together, we'd come in with two entities and we'd create a joint venture agreement whereby us two would be pretty involved. Uh, whereas a, a fund is really those investors that don't want to do anything that are strictly passive, that are just coming in the deal looking for the returns. They're sure. not part of any management or any of the day-to-day -day functions. How do you, you use the term limited partner earlier. Can we dive into that? I sure. mean, how do you actually structure, what kind of clauses are in the agreement that actually limit the partner to liability, um, you know, from debt recourse, from lenders and, and from lawsuits, slip and fall type claims? And, and further, how does that affect the structure? Are these still done through an LLC typically, or do you have to go to like an LLP? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'd say a few years ago, the, the common structure was an LPGP. So again, general partnership and limited partnership. The general partnership is, is pretty much on the hook for, for all liabilities of that partnership. Uh, you've seen sort of a switch um, into most LLCs. The ones I've set up in the last couple of years are, are all LLCs. Um, and frankly speaking, you're going to get the same benefit by just the carve out. So you, you said clauses. So yeah, they're not you know liable for, for any recourse. They're not guaranteeing any of the loans. Um, th there's indemnification clauses that are made by the manager, which is oftentimes the sponsor, um, indemnifying the, you know, the, the limited uh, investors um, for any and all liabilities that may, that may come about. Good. That's interesting. So what size deals are you personally invested in? You know, the one to, to four million dollar range. Okay. Yeah. That, sort that's of value. sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. The value yeah. add. Uh, you know, we got uh, a couple of the partners are, are really good at, at finding tenants and certainly not my strong suit. Um, but when you got partners like that it it becomes uh, a little bit easier. Good. What kind of products are you hot for? Love industrial right now, but who doesn't? Um and uh, can, can actually, you find any deals? <laughs> <laughs> How are you finding those? You tell me. Yeah. Um, honestly, it's just it's 
cold calling again uh that the couple of partners i have are, are really good about just banging the phones and, and getting out there and i create a marketing strategy again i, I sort of stay out of that lane um and let let those guys do it so it's, it's a good compliment in terms of you know my, my skills are more the financial side and obviously due diligence and and the legal side is and they're more like the go-getters and and marketers so sure it's a good good partnership that way um but yeah i mean it is hard to find deals i think you know the deals that we find have some hair on the deal um so we're able to navigate those and, and do some value adds i mean we're not at a point where we're just buying you know an eight cap just you know so we can get those returns yeah you someday maybe yeah well the value add in my opinion is a much less risky strategy than buying a fully stabilized property at an aggressive cap rate we've talked to multiple guests on the show about that you know and it's i think a lot of people are led astray to over leverage themselves into some of these properties yeah absolutely and i've sort of taken a step back too i think initially i was doing more of the again the rehab and the duplexes you know i think a lot of people start that way and then also doing some new development again residential and again that just poses a lot of risks it's a lot of time and it's a lot it's a lot of money as opposed to to some value at commercial properties i mean you know the, the residential you got to worry about environmental if you're going down mm-hmm. and um, a lot of various issues that have come up in the past. So as a, uh, not giving legal advice, but what are some thoughts that you have for people who want to, um, you know, start buying properties or who are already buying properties? What are some mistakes you've seen investors make that you might be able to share that other people might be able to avoid? Sure. Uh, well, cliche answer. Talk talk to attorney first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what, but you know, a lot of people don't, and I get it. Um, you know, I'd say you re- you want to think first about how you want to buy the property if it's if it's residential or commercial. You know, oftentimes you know it's going to want to be in an entity which separates out the liability, um, depending on you know how you set it up. And again, that just goes back to step one. You also have to set up the entity right. Um, there's something called piercing the corporate veil. So if I set it up in LLC and uh, I don't do anything to follow the corporate forms, which is set up a bank account, separate out you know all my accounts. I'm I'm not. Um, you know, commingling funds. I can't um, commingle act- with my savings. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you can, but then uh, that that LLC that you registered isn't uh, isn't worth anything. So um, then they can go after you personally, and that that's where people get into big trouble. How important are like those annual minutes and all those kind of little things? So those are important. Again, it's following what a company should normally do. Um, so you should do you know at least one one annual meeting a year, um, do some written actions. Certainly if you're, if you're taking out loans, you're, those would be required anyway. Um, but you know, electing managers and stuff like that, um, is important. You know, the most important one up front is, is again, that separation of funds. Um, you know, th- there's no real bright line rule, but when you look at court cases, certainly that that's one of the top ones that they look at. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're going to be doing deals with partners, that, that operating agreement or, or partnership agreement is truly, really important. I don't know how many times I've had people come back to me. They didn't have a partnership agreement. Now there's an issue amongst the partners, and uh, now you got to look to the statute, um, which can be blurry at best. Um, and, and one thing to note, so Minnesota had uh, the, an LLC act that was more like a, a corporation to act. Um, two years ago, we changed to be more like the rest of the country, and you know, like oral oral agreements can be constituted as an operating agreement. So you do need to be very careful about what you say um, prior to actually executing a written operating agreement, because things you can say can be construed as, okay, that's the deal. And if somehow that comes out, um, which is a he said, she said, but nevertheless, you, you do need to be careful of what you say. Hmm. Does that apply to other contracts, purchase agreements, option contracts? things like that or is that more just on the partnership side of it you're asking for the verbal stuff yeah okay yeah it depends so there there's you know contracts for longer than a year need to be written uh, it really depends but but for the operating agreement, yes and that's a new thing and people didn't in fact i literally just had a couple of real estate people coming in the office a couple of weeks ago they didn't have anything written down one said that they were you know promised something and now i'm you know they're worried because they, they want to dissolve already and 
um, someone feels as though it's promised, and now it can be construed as, as they did have an, an sure. agreement. So follow the uh, legal guidelines to make sure that your entity affords you those liability protections that it's intended to do and get a prenuptial business agreement <laughs> with your partner, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> exactly right. And then, you know, once you dig into the weeds of the operating, obviously there's going to be things you want to really pay attention to. I'd say things like restrictions on transfer. So, you know, uh, Mike, if you and I have a partnership, um, and, and you're married, I don't, you know, and, and somehow you, you get a divorce or some involuntary transfer, I don't want to be partners with whomever that your interest may go to. So, you know, oftentimes you're going to want to include provisions in there that restrict those transfers. Um, and if there is some sort of involuntary event uh, that does come up, you know, you want to give first right of refusal to the company and the other partners so that they're not having to deal with people they didn't intend to deal with. Yeah, that's good. What What are some of the other clauses that you would have in there? Um, talk to me about buyout provisions. What what kind of format do you like best for that? Like the three appraisal approach, the the shootout approach. Yeah, it's usually uh, it usually is you know one of those three appraisal approaches. Um, sometimes people agree upon some sort of fair market value. If it's just going to be one property in, uh, in in that particular company, they'll they'll figure out a way to, to to get a fair market value. But usually it's an appraiser. Both get them. They come in within you know a certain amount of number. They split the difference. Um, if it's so far off, then yeah, they get they get a third one, um, and then they, you know you go with that one. You ever seen the reverse shootout in practice? No, in in, in a uh, uh, a buyout provision. I have not seen one. No, that's one. That's how we're doing it. We're doing basically if one party wants to buy or sell, they yeah. set the price, right? And then yeah, the yeah. other party for sure can either choose to buy or sell at that price. Yeah. Um, also like called the Texas shootout. The <laughs> Texas shootout. All right. <laughs> I probably got it wrong. So thanks for correcting me. <laughs> now I know. Um, yeah, that reminds me of like when you tell it, your two kids, one of you gets to split the cookie and the other one gets to pick the half. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, I'd say some other important things are you know delving out the management duties. You know, let's say it's it's going to be member managed, for example. Um, which means the members are, are all managers. Uh, and then it's really putting pen to paper on what each manager can do. Um, do they have the ability to take out you know, $10,000? Do they have the ability to take out loans? Oftentimes you want to restrict those abilities to, to big action items. Again, you know, debt, um, sales, um, things of that nature that, that usually you want to require all member consent or at least a majority of the members. What's your favorite for structuring something like that? Is it a you know joint approval or? Yeah, usually it's a, depending on if I'm in the agreement or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you know it really depends. Well, majority in interest is usually which you know is typically defined as more than fifty percent, so fifty one percent or more. Um, if it's if it's something really big, like I would say you know a sale or disposition of substantially all the assets, I'm going to probably want all the members to consent to that. Um, certainly things like, you know, dissolving the company or filing bankruptcy, certainly you're going to want, um, or I'd recommend at least uh, all member consent for those those big items. Yeah. Sure. We've been talking to Brad Heitzinger, and we'll be right back on the Creative Commercial Real Estate Show. Today's show sponsor is National Property Inspections. Steve Quint is my guy. He does all my commercial inspections in all asset classes, industrial, retail, office, and multifamily. Steve's the best of the best here in the Twin Cities. What I love most about him is he goes the extra mile to give me an itemized one-page list of all the major renovations to be done and the cost associated with them. He even gives me a list of all the mechanicals with serial numbers, model numbers, and expected remaining useful life so that I can plan out my annual budget for capital expenditures. If you want a free quote from National Property Inspections to inspect your next investment, call or text him directly at 612-242-4568. I guarantee that you're going to be happy with the results. You're listening to the Creative Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Mike Sowers, your host, and we are back with Brad Heitzinger. Are most of the deals you're doing uh, like where you have two different types of membership units, the the preferred units or the people who are bringing the capital and then the kind of class B units? How, how are you guys labeling them? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's basically exactly what you said. It's, uh, you know, unit A, unit B, either one can be a preferred return. So those people get paid out first if they're bringing the capital. Um, and, then, and then the other one 
um, you know, is just a pro rata share after they reach some return. And then typically the people that bring the capital, depending on the setup, often aren't the ones, you know, day-to-day -day management. Again, that's getting more towards, I would say, a fund. But, um, yeah, usually, usually the capital folks get some sort of preferred return. What are the laws regarding funds? Can I, let's say I want to raise, I'm going to buy a $2 million bill and I need to bring $500,000. Mm -hmm. Am I limited to only people that I have a pre-existing relationship with? Can I have this conversation behind closed doors with people that I don't know, but might be a referral? Like where do you start uh, putting yourself at liability for a potential lawsuit down the road? Yeah, good question. And it, it's a, it's not a bright line rule, of course, like anything in law, but uh, you know, things, things that I tell people are, you know, general solicitation is something you don't want to do unless you're looking to actually not be exempt and having to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Friends and family or pre-existing relationships are, are typically okay. Again, you're still going to want you know, them, they're going to have to sign a subscription agreement and, and other agreements that, that you do provide them with some risks that are involved with the deal. But those folks are, are generally okay um, to talk to about it. And then, you know, then you're getting into also accredited investors, right? So if you're, there's, there's a bunch of exemptions um, that the SEC puts out, you know, one can be if you're just going to be um, talking to folks in a certain state, uh, friends and family, and then what's called in credit investors, and, and the, the metrics. So, to, you know, if you have a million dollar net worth, or if you make more than a certain amount of money, typically two hundred fifty thousand a year in annual salary the last two years, those folks are held to a higher standard. So, they are assumed to have all the knowledge they need in order to make sound investments. So, those folks have have a harder time, you know, suing you down the road if they do invest invest in your deal um, and it does go sour. Um, you know, nobody's suing you if the deal's going great, right? Right. That doesn't mean they, they can't, and it doesn't mean they won't. Uh, it just means that their claims are, are, are not as good as, as someone else. So if it's a general solicitation, you know, on this podcast, if you start talking about a fund, you're, you're going to be in some trouble. Um, if you give the specifics of the fund and you're actually trying to solicit investors, I mean, that, that, that doesn't, that's a no. Um, you, you asked specifically, I think, about sort of a referral source. That's where it gets a little bit bright on. I would err on the side of caution, and I would probably limit that. If that person were an accredited investor, then that then it'd be sense. okay. And again, all this being said, you, you still need to, to give the proper paperwork. And again, subscription agreement, which is them subscribing to the, the deal and they sign all these papers. And it's still a good idea to have at least, uh, even if it's a mini, what's called a, you know, a private placement memorandum or an offering memorandum, which is sort of the Here's the deal. Here's the summary of the operating agreement. Here are the risks. Here's why you know I have experience in in doing these sort of deals. If you have some history, um, and you know, here's why I think it's a good deal. I mean, it's always good to put that. I mean, you should be putting that together basically on your own anyway. Um, uh, or having your attorney do it. Yeah, or having your attorney do it. That's it's right. Good to know, guys like Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Great plug. <laughs> well done. You've so, done this before. So let's uh let's transition back to the waterfall because I think that's an area that is probably the most complicated of these deals and yeah. how you know people it, it, you got a few things. How do I actually go out and find a deal? And then once I have a deal, how do I create a structure that actually works for everybody to be able to get the deal done? Um, so what I yeah. heard from you, let me let me see if I can iterate it back to you and then you tell me if I understand it correctly. Sure. So the IRR waterfall refers to the preference of the distribution of cash flow as it comes into the entity. It, it, goes to pay operating expenses, then the primary debt service, then it goes to pay a return to the preferred maybe class A shareholders up to, let's say, some hurdle rate of 8%, and mm -hmm. that's dictated by that operating agreement. Exactly right. And then beyond that, the next dollar after the 8% is returned. So in our example, we were buying a $2 million building. Bank's going to put up one and a half. We got to bring a half a million in down payment. 8% of that is $40,000. So the first 40000 in cash flow after operating expenses and debt service to the bank are paid goes to the preferred shareholders. 
Then it may be split. Each dollar goes 80 cents to the investors, class A units, and then 20 cents to the class B shareholders. And then that, and then it might be, okay, once we hit 15%, then it goes, you know, 50-50 or something like that. Yeah. Is that, that's, that's exactly okay. right. So that's, um, that's an insider tip for you guys that are new to getting into investing that have probably done a lot of residential deals, but don't understand how to structure a JV for some of these larger deals. That's kind of the industry standard. Um, but there are other ways to do it. It's whatever you and your partners can agree on. That, uh, yeah. And then that's the thing, you know, if you're a very well established developer or, you know, have done a ton, ton of deals and you've had several funds, you know, you might be able to get, get away with a 6% preferred return and then a, you know, an 80, 20 waterfall. Um, someone who's doing one of their first two deals, what I've seen is again, you're looking at an eight to 9% preferred return. Um, and then probably a 70, 30 waterfall. And that's after hitting probably a 15% internal rate of return. Um, you're, you're going to need to give your first investors a deal because they just don't trust you usually. Um, you know, again, the, the funds that I set up for very well established people, they can get away with a 6% and then a 70, 30. Um, why? Cause they've done it and they know they can hit their marks. Um, so it, and every deal is, is very different, you know, and even within deals, you have residential deals that have certainly different rates and you got commercial deals that have, have different rates as well. But if I'm just going to do a deal, let's say me and James want to go out and we want to buy an office property in Plymouth. Uh, if we have a meeting in the mines with an operating agreement, do you think we also, if, if we're the only ones bringing capital and we're both going to sign on debt, do we need to do a, when do you actually need to do a private placement memorandum? Would you still recommend one in that case? I would not for that case. No. I mean, you two know each other. You're just going to the deal. It's going to be 50, 50, assumably assuming that that's true. Um, you know, and that, in that instance, I would say, you two, you know, have known each other, you're met, you're going to do a deal together, you know, fire up an, an LLC and an operating agreement and split the profits 50-50. And then, you know, same with distributions, of course. So now what if we want to bring in, you know, a friend of James that I don't know? When do you cross that line of needing a PPM? And then when do you cross it again to actually wanting to do a full SEC filing under maybe one of the exemption laws in Minnesota? Yeah. I mean, again, usually a full PPM is going to be several investors that neither of, in this case, you two have relationships with before. Okay. If it's going to be people that you know, friends and family of either of you two, assuming you two are the sponsors, um, then you're probably looking more at a, a short form offering memorandum with subscription agreement, um, and, and likely not getting into the full PPM. You know, if you're talking about an institutional fund or funds that are, that are larger and you're doing more of a, uh, of folks that, that don't have prior relationships with you two, then, then likely you're, you're yes. looking at more of a So PPM. there are some in between. There options. is. And again, you know, the tough part is there's no bright line rules. If you want to be super safe... Yes, do a full PPM. At you know. what cost? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And and you know, quite frankly, if if you know, if you have relationships with people, usually it's less of an issue. Um, but you know, the fail safe then is uh, is then if that person is accredited, then then you're in a really good position to have less of a you know a robust who, uh, offering memorandum. Who has the burden of proof for uh, whether they're accredited or not? The investor or the sponsor? The investor is making certain reps and warranties that they are accredited in and, their subscription. Yes, agreement. and you're you're okay. not required to go and look that up. You're not okay. So, Correct. so they don't have to get certified by a third party. They're just saying, "Hey, I'm I'm an accredited investor because I say I am based on these this litmus test of these I qualify under these things." Okay. Right. Yep. Opportunity funds. Yeah. Uh, those are fun. Yeah. You're you're kind of leading the front on the opportunity fund. It's a big buzz in the industry right now. Yeah. Tell me about what kinds of stuff you're doing with raising money for opportunity funds. Yeah. So I just closed one uh, as a pretty prominent developer in town doing an opportunity zone fund in the Phelan uh, neighborhood. Um, a couple of uh, national tenants. Uh, that will be a redevelopment. I did one in New York uh, that is a mix of an Opportunity Zone fund and what's called historic tax credits. Uh, Mike, I think you're familiar with those too. And then I've done another one locally, which was a smaller one, which is just a developer owner. But yeah, you're right. Ton of, ton of buzz on it, ton of traction. 
tough part is we still don't have a lot of uh, you know bright lines from the IRS per the usual. We were supposed to get the new updated regs this week, which of course we're not going to, I assume. But if structured correctly, it can make a good deal great. I, you know, my advice has been don't buy an opportunity zone deal just because it's in an opportunity zone. I think if you already have a good deal, it can make a good deal great. Yeah, it should be the frosting on the cake. Exactly yeah, right. Sense. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And I think some people <clears throat> overdid it, um, you know, by by not thinking about it that way. But it really can you know, really increase in the IRR, particularly if the IRS comes out and say that there's, you know, no depreciation recapture, which everyone's sort of waiting on that. I've taken the position thus far that that does qualify. That portion of the capital gain. Exactly. Because it's meant to be if you own it for 10 years, you get, you know, tax-free appreciation, but you still have to recapture the depreciation. Is that your understanding as well? Yes. Well, well, That's how it normally would work, Uh, you know, and I'm on, you know, a a couple of committees um, in terms of folks that are sort of been watching it and going to conferences. And and I I would say the majority of of leading, you know, tax tax lawyers amongst, you know, in the country are are thinking that um, that also will be excluded. Um, I mean, if you read the, the letter of the code... As it's written, I mean that that's how it's being interpreted by really by most that time. you would not have to recover the correct. Do- so we our four street uh, station projects historic tax credits yeah. and it's an opportunity fund yeah but we were all we only funded about twenty percent of it with tax advantage money from the sale of my uh, remodeling brand mm-hmm. uh, last fall and I was getting earnout payments so. It's probably more of a question for some CPAs and stuff, but do you have any knowledge of if you don't actually use tax advantage money, but you put it into an opportunity fund that invests in an opportunity zone, would you still be afforded those tax-free appreciations in your opinion? I wouldn't think so, no. I mean, I'd need to, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of getting down in those new yeah. days, and you don't you don't really know until probably somebody gets audited ten years down the road. That's the thing, and it's it's so new, and and just there's a lot of questions to be answered. Yeah. Um, but if done correctly, again, I think it does provide a uh, you know some upside to some investors, particularly when you're when you're setting up funds. And with the you know with the proposed regs that came on October, you know if, as long as you do it through a sub fund. Um, you know, only 70% of, uh, the opportunity zone, um, fund needs to be opportunity zone business. So you, you couple the 70% with the 90% on the upper tier. When you do the math, only 63% of your assets need to be opportunity zone property. So that to me is the huge advantage. Um, you know, that means that the rest, the remaining percentage can be invested in anything you want, as long as it doesn't go over that percentage. So, well, hold on, take a step, rewind, <laughs> sub fund, uh, what are you talking about? Yeah. So, uh, let's say us three want to set up an opportunity zone fund. Um, we set up what's called, what would be a top tier. So whatever LLC that is, uh, well, it actually needs to be a partnership or corporation that then owns the stock or the partnership interest of the sub fund, that sub fund then invests, you know, and holds the assets, which are opportunity zone property. And the sub fund would be like an LLC. Correct. Well, it has to be a partnership or corporation as well. Really? Yes. So um, you can't have an LLC that's an opportunity? You can, have a, you can have an LLC taxed as a partnership. Which, by its very nature, if you have more than one person, gotcha. it can't be a sole proprietorship. So I can put in my wife for 1%. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, so LLC or uh, corporation taxed as a partnership or an S corporation. Exactly right. Okay, yeah. and so the sub fund would actually hold title, but the the what, what did you call the first one? Well, the f- the first one is is really just the the, the top level. It's just top that the level, parent, okay. top tier of of the fund. But so so you have to hold ninety percent. So the top tier fund has to hold ninety percent in real estate that is in an opportunity zone. Uh, it has to own ninety percent, you know, opportunity zone business assets, which is either partnership interests, stock, or opportunity zone business. So think of um, a developer, for example, that just buys a property in an opportunity zone that's going to redevelop it that qualifies. In that case, if he just did it through one, you know, one entity, ninety percent of the the assets would need to be opportunity zone property, which of course it would in this case likely because all he did was buy either vacant land or, or property he's redeveloping. Mm-hmm. However, if he would have set up, 
a fund below that, sort of think of it like a subsidiary that's also a partnership in stock, then of course that top tier is holding the interest of it, which constitutes opportunity zone property. And then that lower tier entity would hold title to the opportunity zone businesses. When you do it that way, that lower tier only needs to hold 70% of its assets as opportunity zone business, so real estate or, or otherwise. So if you do the math, again, that top tier needs to hold 90% of its assets, the bottom tier 70, when you do the math, 63%. So it does give you, particularly if you're doing multi-assets, the ability to do stabilized building, for example, and sure. then also the you know the other token of it, which the, is the Opportunity Zone Fund. The plot thickens. Yeah. And, and would those typically be in the same area, or could they be from different Opportunity Zones? Oh, it could be it all over. Yeah, exactly yeah, right. I think in any Opportunity Census track. So... Are you able to set these up as a blind fund, or do you have to have a specific project in mind when you're raising this money? Um, the ones that I have done have had specific projects. You've noticed, though, like Goldman Sachs has an Opportunity Zone fund now, and that's blind. Um, they're just sort of banking on the, their ability to, to find property um, you know, within 180 days, basically, is, is, is what you're looking at. Yeah. Um, I That's, to me, more risky. Um what happens if they raise a bunch of money from people who are coming into this tax advantage entity and then they can't find a deal? I mean, to me, would you want to put grandma's money into that deal? Because they got to go overpay for something or yeah, they're no. going to be in deep water. I, I would not, no. And I I, I think uh, I think that's where it starts to get scary. I've, I've been advising people, unless you have a project ready or something you've identified or even under contract, quite frankly, that... You know, you probably don't want to be taking people's num- money at that point. Mm-hmm. And you know, again, some of the scary parts about this, and, and what I've set up with with opportunity zone funds is, you know, you got to have a bunch of disclaimers and qualifiers because we don't know what we don't know, and the IRS could come out with new regs that that is law um, that you know you thought differently before you set up the fund. So sure, some risks associated with it, but people are generally looking to park their capital gains and. Uh, a good way for for some potential exclusion and deferral. What kinds of problems have you seen between partners, and um, you know how how can we avoid making those same mistakes? You mean generally? Yeah, just just talk in general. You you probably see. Do you see any of the litigation or back end, or are you just doing front end? I mean, I do a lot of front. I've seen you know a lot of the litigation as well. I th- I think it's again mostly figuring out really what the duties and responsibilities of of all the partners are. I think sometimes you get in a situation where two people or three people or however many people have a great idea they all want to go invest in real estate. And naturally, one person ends up not doing much. And then what do you do? You didn't, you didn't, you know, account for that. You maybe want to dissolve it. You maybe want to kick that person out. Um, So I think talking it through, making sure you know what the duties and responsibilities of each partner is, whether someone's going to be passive or an active member of the partnership, um, those transfer restrictions I talked about, it, how profits are being distributed, um, you know, that there is opportunity for what's called special allocations, which can be very complicated in terms of passing on at losses to certain people um, and income to certain people, which is getting super in the weeds. But um, I think just honestly sitting down, even even before talking to, to an attorney or a CPA, figuring out what everyone's going to do, plus that saves you money. I mean, when people come to me basically already knowing what they're wanting in opera game, and obviously their costs are going to go way down. Let's get into the weeds a little bit on the last thing you just said. Can you choose in your operating agreement how to distribute the depreciation and things like that? Uh, you can, but there's certain guidelines per the IRS that, that you need to follow um, in order for those to, to be qualified The beauty of an LLC is that it does offer you the ability to distribute unequally, Um, whereas an S-Corp, you can't do that. An S-Corp is everyone has to get their pro rata share based on their ownership percentage. I didn't know that. Yeah. So an LLC has the ability to, yes, if you, again, want losses, Mike, and I I want income in certain years, you can do that. There's certain tests you got to meet, but I've certainly done that in operating agreements that I've drafted, and it does get very sophisticated. But yes, you do have the ability to... Um, distribute unequally and or distribute losses to more to one person than another person. How does that look? Is that typically like an agreement of all parties? Like, hey, you had an awesome year. <laughs> I didn't do so great. How about we give you all the losses from our passive entity this year to offset your ordinary income and then all make up for it next year? It's not as easy as that. You can't necessarily decide 
by that, but it needs to be predetermined based on, you know, some metric, uh, like five years or something. It can't be based on, all right, end of the year, Mike, you did well. Now we can distribute you gotcha. all the losses. Do you recommend having annual membership meetings somewhere warm where there's sand? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you a lot of tax questions Yeah, for that. I apologize. Um, Thanks for rolling with the punches. Potentially, yes. If you're willing to to to, to fight an audit, if the, if the IRS says, what'd you do? Why'd you need to go there? Sure, do it. That's where I think creatively. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you should do. You should go look at houses and, and other real estate that you might buy. Sure. Set I up some showings. Mm. I always stop into the real estate office and snap some pictures of me with the agent. I drop mean, them in my tax file. Absolutely, yeah. Maybe there's a conference going on, too. Other pieces of advice for joint ventures, things to avoid, things that you like to see in the agreements? Again, I, th- I don't think it's something you just hop into. I mean, if you want to re- truly set up a fund or a joint venture, those can get complicated. And, you know, smart investors are going to ask some serious questions. So if they say, what's the waterfall? And you have a blank stare in your face, I, I would never invest in with you. Why would I? I mean, I, you really got to know your stuff, I think. So I'd say, you know, start small. Um, is, is advice I usually give to people who, who for sure aren't experienced but maybe have some wealthy friends or people that want to invest in real estate in them. Prove yourself, and then you can grow. Sure. Learn. Read <laughs> books, right? Yeah, learning's good. That's right, yeah. Great um, advice. So where do you – what's your source of knowledge in keeping up to date with some of these minute details? Good question. Um, I'm not probably on 300 lift serves and, and updates that we get from you know different uh, subscriptions at work with whether it's tax law or real estate. Um, I try to keep up, but I'm not gonna lie, I, I don't read them all. <laughs> all the <time. laughs> That's a lot yeah. to digest. Uh, I, don't, I go to conferences. Done. Yeah, I go to conf- I go to a lot of conferences too. Um, you know, particularly like with this opportunity zone stuff, I've gone to a lot of Novogradic puts on a um, hell hell of a good conference. Um, in terms of sort of knowing the details. They're, they're an accounting firm, and this is not to plug them, but they're an accounting firm that specializes in tax credits and sort of complicated opportunity zone stuff. And uh, the founder is, has been heavily involved in, in the regulations and um, the legislation. So where is it? When is it? Uh, there's one coming up in Denver. Um, I think it's April 23rd. Don't quote me on that. Um, and then there's, there's one. I know uh, the Minnesota real estate, Journal puts on some conferences. I'm actually speaking at one in April sometime. Again, couldn't tell you the date. Should probably probably know that too. <laughs> Sooner rather than later. Yeah. But again, I think, you know, with real estate, it's also, you talk about learning. Like, Mike, I know you're doing a historic tax credit deal. It's like knowing the different areas where you, you might be able to get some additional credits or capital or, you know, TIF or whatever it might be. I think knowledge is power. If you can start coupling all of the different benefits you might be able to get from municipalities or, you know, the federal government, um, you know, then you can really push yourself forward with some of these deals that, that may have some hair on them. What uh, what do you know about TIF that you can drop some knowledge bombs on us with? M- Minneapolis doesn't give it. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. So for you listeners, TIF stands for Tax Increment Financing, and it's a, a strategy where if you're going to increase – the assessed value on a property, sometimes you can work out an arrangement with the city to which they will basically refund a portion of the increase in taxes that are being distributed to the county. Um, and there's different ways that they can do that. So um, I just wanted to kind of lay the groundwork for our novice investors on what that is, because I think sometimes in this industry, we, we throw around these cocktail <laughs> terms and we just assume that everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, so I appreciate you uh, giving me that opportunity. So what kind of TIF deal, what's the last TIF deal you worked on? Oh, good question. You know, I probably, I don't know if there's even been one, honestly. I mean, I'm familiar with it, but there, there just hasn't been an opportunity for one. Um, actually, I guess there was one uh, one in Maplewood that, that I helped out on. It wasn't actually my client, but it was a, it was a residential single family division that that they were allowing for just because maplewood hasn't had any of that in in quite a while gotcha have you seen other people doing doing tiff deals again minneapolis has been really stingy with them um i think in the outlying suburbs particularly where they're looking for investment or redevelopment i mean i think i just personally came across a deal where was that in rosemount where they were offering uh some tiff and a new and as a redevelopment it's one of their 
targeted areas. I mean, what cities typically do is they have targeted areas where they want it to grow or be redeveloped. And in those scenarios, they'll even they'll pitch it. You know, here sure. we'll you know we'll give TIF. Yeah, TIF um, districts. Exactly right. Yep, there's designated districts where they're able to give you um, some of those benefits. And my understanding is that it actually comes from state. The state dictates um, the types of TIF districts that a city can have. Um, but a city can take a particular property, like we're uh, we're looking at a opportunity in Moundsview right now. And it's not in one of the TIF districts, but they can create one around it for, say, a blighted property. Um, but I see most of the conversations we've been having with the economic development authorities and um, council people have been that they're not super hot on it. So I 100% agree with you, unless it's for like uh, low-income housing. Yeah, They tend to be super hot on the low-income housing. But what I found with you know even the low-income housing tax credits, the TIF, even the historic tax credits... If you're not doing a massive deal, most of the stuff becomes cost prohibitive because of the the additional time to go through it all, all the strings that come attached with nothing comes for free. You might get a million bucks in TIF money, but it might increase your construction costs because you have to use a certain uh, caliber of labor who knows that they're in scarce demand and they charge 30, 40% higher. So a lot of times you end up eating all of it back. And then if you're committing to a low income deal, but uh, it can make sense. And I think really getting into the weeds and understanding some of those details and how to analyze them and going to seminars to do that is important. Yeah. And I'd agree. I think uh, particularly with the tax credits, which can get really sophisticated and complicated as, as you know, Mike, um, you know, you, you bigger deals do make sense unless you can keep the credits for yourself, which is sometimes the case. Yeah. Um, and then you're right, like with low income housing tax credits, which is you know, LIHTC it's called. Um, you know, there's there's an application process that is super long, and it's going to go to some of the you know, like Dominion for example, gets a lot of the LIHTC money. Right. Um, the which nine, again is state percent money. Exactly. Yeah. And and mostly you're going to have to do all affordable, whereas you know right. the requirement's only twenty, but um, to get to get, you know, the actual money from the state, right? Good you luck have the otherwise. different tiers, exactly. Sixty percent, exactly. Forty percent. It's it's really hard hard to get those. Um, that's right. Yeah, I was it, talking to a lot of other developers on that, and they said it, they actually don't make sense on paper. They, a lot of them are just doing them because that's part of that strategy to develop that relationship mm-hmm. with the city, and that's what's best for the community. Yeah, and there's a. You know, I think we've all seen as a huge push for it. You have the potential of that uh, inclusionary housing that they're um, looking at doing in Minneapolis, which is essentially forcing new builds or if you're taking city money to to have 20% affordable units, which is is a really interesting debate amongst developers currently. Yeah. We actually have an option on a deal right now that's for 16 units. And our understanding was that the city forced them to do a portion of their building low income, and we're not even, and, and the developer doesn't even, isn't even doing, oh, wow. uh, getting city money. So they're kind yeah. of doing it uh, just across the board in Minneapolis now right. to just say, hey, look, you know, we're not approving your deal unless you're doing. That's not my primary research, so I can't speak to yeah. the accuracy of that. But um, that's that's what I heard. Yeah, it's it's not getting a lot of fanfare from from developers. But it, I guess the the idea was it's sort of the compromise for the upzoning and the, the the new comp plan. Sure, mm. which is another whole other topic. <clears throat> yeah, when is the comp plan set to be approved? I I've heard various. Yes, days, time frames. I but. I thought it was supposed to be. I mean, it's obviously approved, but it needs to go through the Met Council, and, yeah. um, which was supposed to be approved. Gosh, yeah, a few weeks ago, I think. But like anything in government, it's going to take way longer than expected per usual. Mm. I haven't I, heard early next year, but don't get me yeah. started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and one thing on that note, Mike. So when we met with uh, City of the North Metro, what they say about. You know, as far as zoning and changing the zone exactly. Do you remember that conversation? Yeah, what uh, the the workaround is that the cities can amend uh, the zoning requirements for a particular zone to include the, you know, to allow for the type of project you want to do in the current zoning. So let's say we want a highway district zoning or need that for a project, but it's currently I-1. They can amend the I-1 that allows, you know, building a, a, you know, extended stay hotel for the time being until the 
the new comp plan gets approved and then they can amend it back. Obviously the drawback is they would allow anybody else in an I one yeah, zoning yeah. district. So there's a little bit of that, but that seems to be a workaround yeah. that could potentially be feasible if they're hot to get something in the ground. Yeah, for sure. They don't typically like to spot zone, but Yeah. Um, so that's the that's the industry term for it, spot zone. I haven't yeah. heard that one yet, but yeah. Well, okay. it's, you know, if if you're gonna do something for someone that that's typically not allowed, you know, a gas station or a hotel, for example, in a residential area, for you know, then you open the floodgates. And so if you're just again spot zoning that one spot, other people yeah. are gonna come forward and they're gonna use that to apply for for their areas, and they're gonna so say why you know why it, am I? Yeah, setting a precedent. To- yeah, unless you're in Houston, which doesn't have zoning and you can have a you know skyscraper next to a house so it's super <laughs> interesting with no buffer zone yeah it's it's, it's it's wild wild west wow nice well uh personal question for you brad why do you do what you do love deals i mean i've always like i think even my attorney bio says you know like deal lawyer or something something like that i just i really am addicted to the deals it's even even on the lawyer side i mean it's, it's frankly more fun doing it personally but um, I'm sort of a deal junkie and I and always have been. So I just keep doing deals. Good. Well, uh, it's been great to have you on the show and uh, I appreciate you sharing a lot of insight on joint ventures. It's always an area that I feel is kind of glossed over. People go out, everybody wants to talk about the, the, the sexy pursuit of getting a deal done. But uh, when it comes to the nitty gritty of how do we actually structure a prenuptial agreement between partners here to really think through all the different aspects of it. Um, I think that uh, having that insight is absolutely critical. Things like understanding how an IRR waterfall works and what is a sponsor and a promote and all those different terms. So uh, yeah. it's been a blessing having you on the show and uh, thanks for coming in today. Yeah, I really appreciate thanks a lot. it. Thank you for listening to our show, Creative Commercial. Head over to our website at creative.realestate.com or find us wherever you listen to podcasts. And please, if you like the show, leave us a review. It really helps us out.